On this episode, we examine pedestrian wayfinding signs in Philadelphia. Then we head west to Davis, California, where the town and the university are bicycle and pedestrian friendly. Nearby in Sacramento, traffic calming measures are under development in several neighborhoods. In San Francisco, technology is being used to catch red light runners. And finally, we look at more of the little things that make life difficult for pedestrians. Stay tuned. We're talking with Craig Berger, who's project director at the Foundation for Architecture. Uh, what is the foundation? Foundation for Architecture is um, it was an organization that was set up ab about uh, 17 years ago to encourage um, public and um, public dialogue in uh, design and built environment issues. And you've been working on a, a project called Walk Philadelphia. Yes. What's that all about? Well, Walk Philadelphia is the largest pedestrian sign program in North America. It was, um, it was originally, it's a, it's a joint project between the Foundation for Architecture and the Center City District. And it basically is a project of um, directional signs at each intersection to over 200 destinations in Center City. And also includes um, something called a disk map, a heads up disk map, which is a map um, of a specific area of Center City or all of Center City that is oriented to the direction that the pedestrian is traveling in. So you, it's not north is automatically up on, on these maps? Uh, no, uh, north is not automatically up. In fact, if you are walking east, east will be up. If you are walking west, uh, west will be up. And, um, and behind us, there's a, there's a map. Uh, you can see um, this is of the Parkway area. And in this case, the, uh, the art museum, which uh, is here, is pointing up. So if you are heading towards the art museum, what you will see on the map will be the art museum being up and City Hall, which is on the other end of the parkway spine, being behind you. And so this orients the pedestrian to the direction they are walking instead of orienting, orienting them to an artificial north, south, east, or west. Which they might not have any idea which way north is anyway. Well, I, I usually when a pedestrian is involved in a city, I, walking in a city, they really usually don't know wh which direction north, south, East or west is in. It would almost be like we were sitting in this, standing in this room right now. And if you, if anybody could tell me which direction north is, that's almost the situation a pedestrian is in. Of course, a resident probably has some awareness of which direction north is in. But even in in that case, I'm I'm not completely sure of that either. From a lot of the disorientation I see from people who've lived in Philadelphia their entire lives. Now, what what sort of destinations do you put on these signs? Well, there was. A, there's, of course, the obvious destinations like the Liberty Bell and Independence Hall, which everybody knows about, but also things like historic churches, museums, um, historic house museums, um, um, important municipal buildings, and um, the free libraries of Philadelphia. So basically, um, generally, they have to be public institutions that have regular office hours and are, um, and are and, um, usually you know, regular office hours and are free and open to the public. And this, uh, you have another set of signs that orients drivers. Uh, right. How do the two of these work together? Well, one is called Direction Philadelphia, which is a vehicular sign program. And the vehicular sign program orients um, the driver to the, the, the general proximity of the destination. Um, of course, once the driver um, gets close to their destination, they have to get out and park their car. And then the um, disk maps, the ones you see before us, orients um, a person generally in the area they are at, you know, in the proximity to all the other areas of Center City. And the direction, uh, the directional signs, the smaller pedestrian directional signs, will orient the pedestrian um, with arrows to the exact location they're at. So this hierarchy of signs works somebody from, if somebody's getting off, say, an interstate highway, They'll, they'll get off the highway and they'll see these directional signs leading them to a specific district and then from th then on in to a specific destination. And once out of their car, the pedestrian signs will orient them to their exact destination. But of course, if you don't drive, you just have the pedestrian system. And if you just want to drive directly to the destination, you just have the vehicular system. So, but, but, it, but in reality, these two systems do work in concert and in tandem. And one does relate to the other. We're talking with Tim Bustos, who's Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator for the City of Davis, California. 
Davis has a reputation for being bicycle friendly. How'd that all get started? Well, it actually got started back in the uh, mid-1960s. Actually, right around 1966 was a pivotal point. The uh, city council election that year, uh, bicycles were a big issue. And it was right about that time the city decided that they wanted to make non-motorized transportation a priority in the city of Davis. Davis was starting to grow a lot right then. They had the example of other California cities sprawling, and they didn't want to be one of those sprawling, auto-oriented communities. And they just started enacting a lot of policies and programs to make it more convenient and conducive for, for bicycles and pedestrians to get around. And there are different elements of the population that can be key to supporting bicycles. What would you see as the, the major groups involved? Well, I think in a lot of communities it starts with a real active constituency, but it really takes more than that. There's, there's really three elements. One, of course, is an active constituency. The other is you need a city council, elected officials that are willing to provide for bicycling, or you need a um, dedicated, knowledgeable public work staff, planning staff, that's so willing to proceed with some of these plans. Davis is fortunate that we really have all three of these elements. Uh, citizens that want good bicycle and pedestrian facilities, elected officials that are willing to provide those, and knowledgeable staff that can design and put these uh, projects on the ground. What sort of things have you been doing over the last three decades that have made the place so friendly for bicycles? Uh, a lot of it has been policy oriented. For one thing, the city has determined that they want no roads in Davis greater than four lanes, so there are none. Uh, we're not going to have this continuous expansion from four to six to eight. It's just not going to happen. There are other policies that there aren't going to be any um, large regional malls on the outskirts of town, which also promote auto travel, regional sprawl. And so they've tried to set it up in each neighborhood, each area of town has shopping that's convenient. Within walking or bicycling distance, you have grocery stores, drug stores, uh, basic facilities. And the city has also embarked on a program of actively providing sidewalks, bike paths, bike lanes. The city currently has bike lanes and bike paths uh, along 80% of all its arterials and collectors. So it's a, it's a good system, it's an interconnected system, and it tries to keep it that way. For example, when new developments come into town, whether they are business commercial developments or residential developments, uh, developers are required to provide for bicycle and pedestrian movement on an equal basis to motor vehicle movement. New neighborhoods have to have green space set aside for bicycles and pedestrians, and the bike lanes, the bike paths they build have to connect with everything else that's already existed. So all the neighborhoods are interconnected. A child doesn't have to go out on a main road to get from one neighborhood to the next or to get to school. Are most of your children able to walk to school? Yeah, most of the children are able to walk or bicycle to school, which is important because in the city of Davis, there are no public school buses. So there's a big incentive there. And as a result, a huge number of kids walk and bicycle to school. And most parents can be confident that they're going to be reasonably safe in getting there. And is there more to making a place bicycle friendly than just the physical infrastructure? Good question. Yeah, I want to emphasize as many of the viewers probably already know, it's not just engineering, but um, just as important, if not more important, is the educational component. You have to teach cyclists from a very young age, at the elementary school age, that um, they need to understand the rules of the road. They need to understand that bicycles are vehicles, pedestrians are also part of the traffic mix, and they need to learn and follow the same rules that motor vehicles are following. That's a very, very important element I can't emphasize enough that coupled with an equitable law enforcement program that enforces the laws for bicycles and pedestrians on an equal basis with motor vehicles. And you've already done a lot. What do you see yourself doing in the future? What can you do over the next 30 years? Holding the course, making sure that we don't fall back on some of the same problems that other California communities are experiencing, um, trying to institute some sense of controlled growth in the city rather than runaway growth and maintaining the high level of standards the city has had in terms of urban design and providing for non-motorized transportation. We still have a number of ambitious projects in mind. Um, the city has grown a great deal to the south, south of Interstate 
80 rich ones east and west between Sacramento and San Francisco. Um, because typically overcrossings, especially where they involve interstate on and off ramps, have been problematic for bikes and pedestrians. The city is in the process of designing an underpass which will go underneath Interstate 80. Ambitious in that uh, Interstate 80 is six lanes where it runs through Davis. So this underpass will go underneath the interstate and it will be a bicycle path running along Pewter Creek and it will be a vital connection between North and South Davis. And it's close to a $4 million project and I think it once again demonstrates the city's level of commitment to bicycles and pedestrians. We're talking with David Takamoto Wirtz, who's the bicycle program coordinator at University of California, Davis. Uh, the city of Davis has been known for being bicycle friendly since, uh, since the 1960s. Uh, how about the university? Well, the university, uh and the city worked uh, together pretty much, at least at the same time, to develop a more friendly environment for cyclists. Um, both the city and the campus recognized that, gee, there's a lot of bicycles here in Davis. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to uh, encouraging bicycle use. And so we're going to do some things to, to make life better for, for everyone. And the university, uh, probably the first thing they did was to close off the center area of campus, close off the campus streets to motor vehicle use. And um, at one time, you, anyone could drive through the campus, around the campus. Um, but at that time, sometime in 1965 or 66, they put gates on the uh, road entrances to the campus, and only bikes could get in and out except for some emergency and service, service vehicles. Um, at the same time, the university started to build bike paths from the perimeter of campus into the core area to provide, uh, again, a, sort of some separated routes for cyclists um, where Otherwise, they'd be cycling on some of the perimeter roads, which, uh, of course, saw heavier traffic now that uh, the core area had been closed off to, uh, to motor vehicles. All those bicycles on campus, people have to put them somewhere. What do you do for bicycle parking? Well, uh, the other decision that was made at some point in the early 60s was to provide bicycle parking at uh, virtually every destination on campus. So uh, what you find now is that bicyclists ride their bikes between classes, you know, classrooms to the, from class to the library, to the coffee house, uh, wherever they're going. Um, different from a lot of other campuses where people ride their bikes to the campus uh, to, a, you know, a few mass parking areas and then walk around. Here we have uh, cyclists out, outnumbering pedestrians about four to one. And with a, with a total number of somewhere between 15,000 and 18,000 bikes on campus daily, that's sort of a, um, a constant challenge to provide both sufficient bike parking at locations and uh, good routes for the cyclists on campus. Are the universities must come to you for advice now and then. What sort of problems do they have and, and what solutions can you give them? Okay, uh, probably the most common problem that I'm hearing these days uh, are at other campuses where they're suddenly seeing more and more people on bicycles. They want to encourage that, but they don't really have the facilities particularly in terms of bike paths or roadways that are, that are pretty accommodating of bicycles. And what they find is this bicyclists in the center of these campuses are often trying to share the sidewalks with pedestrians, and a lot of times that doesn't work out. But we've, uh, we've made a conscious decision years ago to provide good facilities for both cyclists and pedestrians. And, um, for example, if we build a bicycle path, uh, we strive to have an adjacent sidewalk so we can separate the, the two uses. Uh, within the core area where bikes are pretty much on the roadways anyway, again where there are very few motor vehicles, we had sidewalks already, that wasn't a problem, but uh, in subsequent years we've had to make a conscious effort to separate the bikes from the pedestrians wherever we can because the conflicts, potential conflicts are great. Uh, the pedestrians on this campus, because they're somewhat outnumbered, tend to be very vocal about uh, their right of way, and so we try to deal with that as best we can. What fraction of the student body rides a bicycle on a regular basis? Uh, we do an annual survey, and uh, typically it's around about 60% of the students use uh, indicate bicycles as their primary mode of transportation to and from the campus. Um, for staff and faculty, it's about 
And we have 24,000 students and about uh, 8,000 staff and faculty. We're talking with Ken Graham, who's a senior engineer with the city of Sacramento. It's a lot of activity going on in this neighborhood. What are you doing? Well, a lot of things happening right now in our midtown area. We're trying to slow down traffic. A lot of our streets right now are being used as thoroughfares down to our downtown area, but they're still very uh, uh, vibrant residential communities. And we're doing some steps to slow down traffic, and we have like six or seven different items that we're doing as part of our Midtown Neighborhood Preservation Transportation Plan. That's quite a name. How did it all get started? Well, probably almost 20 years ago now, people, people from this area have come to the city and said, people are going too fast in our area, and what can we do to help? There was a lot of resistance, a lot of new ideas were brought out, and for pretty much the past 10 to 15 years, it's been a consensus building process because these streets are used by our commuters. 20,000 plus cars a day are going down trying to get to serve businesses in the downtown area. And so we've been working with them to try to find a plan that would serve the residents of this area, but also the businesses in the area and adjacent to the area. I take it you had to do a, a lot of compromises and a, a lot of thinking to come up with something that would serve all those different needs. There was a lot of compromising. I don't believe any one group got everything that they wanted. Uh, we, we talked, we, we powwowed until our heart's content, and we finally came up with a plan that technically worked out, but at the same time reached some goals of each of the respective groups. So what are the main things that you're doing? Uh, well, we've got uh, We've had a couple one-way streets that are being converted to two-way streets. That's the cornerstone of the project. But then we have many devices that will heighten pedestrian awareness, bicycles, and just slow down traffic in general. We have items like traffic circles, uh, items we're calling portals, which are basically constrictions at the end of streets to give a little tighter feeling for folks. We have some pedestrian islands like we see behind us. Uh, and also we'll have some what we're calling half street closures, where we'll be forbidding through traffic through certain intersections. Uh, construction's going on uh, as we speak. Uh, how soon do you expect to finish all this up? The project will be completed in November, so we probably have another four to six weeks of work, and it's just a process of going through. We're talking a community that's uh, 10 blocks by 13 blocks, so quite a 130 square block area that uh, we're canvassing with different devices that will work together to slow down traffic while still allowing traffic to move through. We're talking with Bridget Smith, who's a civil engineer at the city of Sacramento. This is just one neighborhood in the city. What else, what are you doing elsewhere? Right, like you said, this Midtown project has been going on for a long time, and uh, the city now has a neighborhood-wide project that we actually will go to different neighborhoods throughout the city and bring the same type of traffic calming measures to um, any neighborhood, actually, that we have. Do you see the, the same mix of, uh, of methods, or does it vary by neighborhood? Each neighborhood's unique. Basically, um, the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program is what I'm working on, and one of our goals is to try to preserve the quality of life in neighborhoods um, for those people who live there. Um, it's, it's a common phenomena throughout our country that motorists are invading our neighborhoods for a variety of reasons. Commuting is one of them. So we're trying to preserve the quality of life there by um, letting the streets be used by other people like pedestrians and bicyclists um, and, and sharing the street with autos. Uh, now, does this get started with citizens coming in with complaints? What's the usual procedure? Typically, that's how it does start. We get about a thousand traffic complaints each year. So this is one way that people can have their issues addressed. Um, we also have other ways that are more direct. But this gives um, citizens an opportunity to get involved in the process. Ours is actually a community-based program. So we have committees that represent the neighborhood we're working with, and they meet monthly with a traffic engineer to resolve their issues. And they get to really actively participate in the solutions. The time frame between when you first get complaints, you go through the public process, how long before someone's painting stripes or pouring concrete? It varies by the commitment level of the neighborhood. Typically, um, the committees will meet three to five times. So within six months of good work, we can get stuff out on the roadways. <laughs> We're talking with Jack Fleck, who's a traffic engineer with the city of San Francisco. What sort of problems have you had with 
red light violations in the city? Well, it's been a problem for many years. We estimate there are between eight or 900 accidents every year with an average of about 1,300 people that are injured every year in San Francisco due to people running red lights. So it is a very serious problem that has been uh, ongoing for a number of years here. And traditionally, what's been your approach to trying to deal with the problem? Well, we certainly have encouraged enforcement. The police write something like 15,000 uh, citations for people running red lights every year, but our computations would indicate that there are something like maybe 3 million people that end up running red lights. So as you can see, that's only catching a very small percentage, so people feel they have a certain likelihood of getting away with it. Um, I think the other thing that we've started recently is we've started a red light awareness campaign so that people really understand the consequences of running red lights in terms of the uh, lives lost, the property damage, everything that happens when people run red lights. It's kind of like wearing seat belts or putting uh, your kids in a safety seat. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, or drunk driving. All these things have been awareness campaigns in recent years, and this is the same kind of thing. It's not something that should be winked at. It really is a very serious uh, public health problem. And recently, you've had a little help from technology. Right. What's um, going on? All right. Our most recent program is a red light uh, photo enforcement, and San Francisco launched a pilot program about a year ago where we installed cameras at four intersections, and these cameras are intended to take photographs of people who enter the intersection on the red and then takes a second photo to prove that they continued on through the intersection. So these have held up in court and there's a state law in California that allows us to uh, issue citations to people who are photographed in this way. And uh, it's been a successful program in terms of public acceptance and in terms of uh, actually reducing the number of people running the red lights at those intersections. There have been some problems in terms of the citations in California. There's not really enough revenue that comes to the cities to support the program because they are expensive. The cameras cost something like $50,000, plus all the loops, the wires uh, in the intersection. It's very expensive to put these in. Uh, California right now, both the Assembly and the Senate, have passed new legislation which would raise the fine from uh, the current level of $104 up to $270 for people running red lights. And it would earmark a larger percentage. Right now, only $17.50 goes to the local jurisdictions uh, for uh, to pay for the program. It's just not enough. But with the new program, at least $80, possibly as much as $100 will go for paying for the program. So we think with that going into effect uh, next year, as soon as the governor, governor signs it, which we hope he will, then uh, this will make the whole program much more financially feasible. And a lot of people are probably surprised to hear that. They think people are giving out tickets as a, as a revenue generator, but the city's actually been losing money on these. Well, in a, in a sense, that's true. Actually, the way we wrote our pilot program, the uh, vendors that are actually taking the pictures are the ones that are losing because they're only getting paid what we get. And they more or less did it as a way to demonstrate the effectiveness of the program, not as a revenue maker. Of course, in the long run, they are profit-making enterprises, and they would like to... Uh, you know, make money on their investments. Have you had any other difficulties with the program? Well, one of the other issues in California is that the law requires that we identify the driver so that we take a front photo and we have to catch both the license plate and the driver. But uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the rear view mirror or perhaps the sun visor or various things can make it difficult to identify the driver. So one of the things that we have uh, lobbied for and we are still considering trying to lobby for in Sacramento is a change in the law that would allow us to uh, cite the registered owner. Um, it may be that we'll compromise. We don't have any objection to citing the driver if we can identify them. But because there are a number of times when people are just getting away because we can't identify them, we feel like we should be able to uh, issue something of a order of a parking ticket, the same without a point going against somebody's license. Uh, in cases where we can't identify the driver, but the registered owner would still have to pay a fine, just like a parking ticket. So if it's illegal to park too long next to the meter, it should be illegal to risk someone's life in an intersection. Right. Your vehicle was seen doing something illegal. Now, who was driving is not, in that case, uh, absolutely the key point. What's important is that you know there should be a, a penalty for that. And assuming these changes are made, are you looking forward to expanding the number of intersections? Right. Well, just based on the increased uh, fine, we feel that we can increase the number of intersections from the current. Uh, well, actually, we've got five in operation right now. We can go up to, we're hoping, as many as 30. 
and then we'll see uh, how the law goes, how that program works out. And uh, there are over a thousand signalized intersections in San Francisco, so I think we've talked about trying to go up to 50 to 100 in the long run, but for right now we think 30 is, is pretty ambitious. We'll try to do that and see how it goes. So what's your goal with this program? Well, I cited the number of accidents we have. Certainly our number one goal is to reduce those accidents, save lives, save injuries, and just save the economic disruption to the city that it costs. We have to send emergency vehicles. It costs the city money for all of that. So what we'd like to see in the long run is a definite drop in the number of accidents. Now, the program that we have now, it's just started. It's only been a pilot program for one year, so we can't really document that at this point. Uh, I certainly feel that over the course of a five-year program, we'd like to say we were successful in, say, reducing the number of accidents caused by red light running at least measurably, and, you know, 20%, something like that would be a great uh, achievement. One of the little things that can affect pedestrians is how you get from the front door of a building out to the sidewalk. We're in Washington, D.C., next to one of the local broadcast stations, where they have a perfect example of how not to do it. First, they put the front door of the building on the part of the building away from the street, not out close to the sidewalk. But it doesn't make any difference. They have a fence and a garden blocking the path out to the street. Someone visiting this building or working at this building has to head south half a block down the driveway to get out to the side street before they can head north back to where they started from. They've had to put up signs telling pedestrians not to take a shortcut through the garden. A telling sign that they should have put a pedestrian path there in the first place. Why would this be important? There are restaurants, apartments, and the subway stop just a few blocks north of here. By having people go half a block south and then half a block north to get where they started, you've made pedestrians go a full block out of their way to get to that subway stop. Landscape architect and the building architect should have known better. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.